One thing that can sometimes surprise people is when we say like, what's the difference between a crow or a raven? So there's two different answers to that question. The first answer is it's completely arbitrary and not anything actually. And what I mean by that is if you were to go to some remote island and discover a new bird, and it was clearly in that ilk, and you wanted to know, should I call this uh, Kevin's crow or Kevin's raven? You get to just pick that (laughs) because it's arbitrary. There's no actual defining feature except size. Generally, we tend to call the bigger ones ravens, but it's that's pretty much made up. But once it gets that name, then there are definitive characteristics we can look to to decide if what you're looking at in your yard is an American crow or a common raven, for example. Okay. So they are different animals. They have the same relationship to each other as a lion and a tiger. So when you actually are looking at a bird, how do you figure out what it is? Uh, There's a couple of really distinctive features that you can look to. One is size. So common ravens are about two and a half times the size of a crow. The the tell is if you feel like you would lose in a fight, then <laughs> you're dealing with a raven. But if you're like, ah, ah, I, I could think take I it. Probably, then it's, <laughs> then it's more of a crow. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Epic Gardening Podcast. This week, I've been waiting for for quite some time. If you've been a follower on some of our social channels, you know, I've become obsessed with crows. I really have. I don't know exactly what hooked me. Perhaps there was just a summer where tons of crows were in the backyard and then I tried to figure out something that some way to interact with them. And that's happened. And you'll see it in the coming days here on the show. But we have Dr. Kaylee Swift on the podcast, who has a PhD in avian behavioral ecology from the University of Washington. She studied American crows while there with a special emphasis on behaviors around death and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Washington, where she's studying the breeding ecology of the Tinian monarch. I hope, hopefully I said that right, uh, Kaylee, did, but yes. I'm, I'm very, very, very excited to have you on the show. Everyone has been wanting us to talk ever since I got into the crow world, this crossover. Uh, so I'm very excited to have you. Great. I'm super excited to be here. Okay. So I know we're talking crows versus ravens today. I, I legitimately do not know the difference whatsoever. And I do not know how to tell the difference. I don't even know, maybe I'm talking to ravens outside and not crows. So how how do you even differentiate? I think the most important background that folks need is that when we talk about crows and ravens, we're discussing the group of birds called the corvids, which is a term some of your uh, listeners might be familiar with. And that's a big family of birds that includes the crows, ravens, jays, scrub jays, Canada jays, uh, nutcrackers, magpies. And then if you go elsewhere in the world, it could include things like rooks, jackdaws, chuffs. So it's a, a big group of songbirds, actually. So crows and ravens are songbirds, just like robins uh, and other kinds of you know song sparrows. So the common raven, which is the species of raven that we have here in the United States, one of them, is actually the biggest songbird in the world, which is pretty cool. A lot of people don't know that. But so the, we have this like big family of birds. And within that family, there's actually a lot of different individual species that are either called, you know, something crow or something raven. So in total, there's about 45 different birds that are some kind of crow or raven. So the most common species we have here in the United States are American crows and fish crows. And then we have common ravens and Chihuahuan ravens. Those are kind of the main core, you know, uh, crow or raven birds that folks might encounter. One thing that can sometimes surprise people is when we say like, what's the difference between a crow or a raven? So there's two different answers to that question. The first answer is It's completely arbitrary and not anything, actually. And what I mean by that is if you were to go to some remote island and discover a new bird and it was clearly in that ilk and you wanted to know, should I call this uh, Kevin's crow or Kevin's raven? You get to just pick that (laughs) because it's arbitrary. There's no actual defining feature except size. Generally, we tend to call the bigger ones ravens, but it's that's pretty much made up. But once it gets that name, then there are definitive characteristics we can look to to decide if what you're looking at in your yard is an American crow or a common raven, for example. Okay. So they are different animals. They have the same 
relationship to each other as a lion and a tiger. Okay, that's that is where I was going to go because obviously I'm a plant guy, and so I would say, is it a situation in which you know in the brassica family you have brassica oleracea, uh, and you have like a kale, which is that's the species name, and then you also have cabbage, um, or or some of these other like common vegetables that seem different, but like from a species perspective are, are the same. They're just cultivars of the same species. Is that does that it's not that in in the no, world of grass? These okay. are different species. Okay, got it. But yeah. but I would get to if I went and found a new corvid that was perhaps crow or raven esque, I do get to choose which one to call it. Yeah, it's basically okay. arbitrary. But again, in general we call the bigger ones ravens, but eh, okay. a little hand So maybe. so okay, so that's <laughs> that's so interesting though, because it I guess I'm still a little confused. So if I was to then call one a raven that was on, let's say, the small side, that's valid. No, there's no laws. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. no one can stop you. <laughs> but I, but I could not call it a pigeon. You couldn't call it a pigeon. Yeah. Nope. That's a different. That's a different kind of bird. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so, so it then, would have to be taaxonomically. It would have to be in the Corvus genus. Got it. And it that is the, that has identifiable characteristics of which you can yes. then slot it in there. Yes, so, exactly. so are, if if I want to find. Out if I have, let's say, in my backyard, a raven or a crow, how would I actually know them? All right. So then that is a, the next question, right? So when you actually are looking at a bird, how do you figure out what it is? So for, uh, and the rules are going to de- depend on where you are in the world, you know, because we could be talking about hooded crows versus common ravens or house crows, blah, blah, blah. But for your situation where you're dealing mostly with American crows versus common ravens, Uh, there's a couple of really distinctive features that you can look to. One is size. So common ravens are about two and a half times the size of a crow. So I always tell people if you're like, see, especially if you're more used to seeing crows, you come more from a city and you're used to seeing crows and you see a raven, you'll recognize it. You'll know. It's big. You'll just, because you'll be like, oh my God. Like the, the tell is if you feel like you would lose in a fight, then you're (laughs) dealing with a raven. But if you're like, ah. I, I could take I could it. Probably that is, that is more of a crow. Well, one crow, right? If it was a whole flock of crows, then you're in trouble. But how many crows, crows do you think you could take? Like what? You know, ten? Are you are you winning against ten crows? No. Okay. No. But I, uh, ten crows, I'm doing. You know, I'm yeah. doing Tippy Hendren and the birds and like yeah, 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 yeah. in the corner. <laughs> I think I think I could probably take like maybe ten. But if we get into the teens, I'm scared. And then in Raven World, m- maybe I could get away from like five. You don't think so? <laughs> no. <laughs> like, what if they're I was just, big, you know, just stiff farming them? Yeah, they're they're big. You will be. I mean, if one raven really had it out for you, uh, you would be on your knees. I mean, okay, that's fair. Well, how they're how big, they are big like ass a, birds? <laughs> tell me, tell me, like a wingspan. Oh, that's a great question. I can't. I don't know the wingspan off of the top of my head. Um, I'm not good. Those those kind. That's not the kind of scientist I am. The one okay, that that's fair. All the numbers. That's fair. <laughs> Well, here's a, here's another question then. So I'm in Southern California here in San Diego. I'm very confident that these are crows I'm dealing with. Yeah. Uh, because like you said, apparently I would know they'd be so large. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there the chance that there just aren't ravens in my area? It's like geographically, are they more prominent in certain areas? So they are more prominent in certain areas um, because so there's a lot of conflict between crows and ravens. So places where crows have really strong, you know, uh, numbers and you know they have their kind of territories all situated they'll try and keep ravens out Mm. so it might be yeah that you just don't have and you know a ton in your area but as far as the other tells go so sizes can be a good one um but some of the more distinctive features are if you're seeing a photo of a bird or you can see it's you know details close enough uh you want to look at the throat ravens have these really long throat feathers called hackles mm. and they can articulate them in all kinds of ways and they can also articulate the feathers above their um kind of their eyes uh so it gives them all kinds of expressions in ways that crows can't they can sort of like do the puff but they don't get the same level of articulation that a raven does and they don't okay. have those long throat feathers so their throats are going to look really smooth very fine almost okay. like okay okay the next thing to look for is if the bird is in flight, uh, you want to look for tail shape. So ravens have this really distinctive diamond shape tail versus crows have more of a square tail or round. Okay. Uh, and then voice is the other easy one. If it's a bird that you're interacting with in person, crows do like the caw, like you hear in a, you know, 
in a show. The stereotype, yeah. The stereotype versus ravens have this really deep, almost echoey croak. Uh, it's not a caw. It's a deep mm. croak. Um, and so that that can be a really distinctive one. And then, of course, both birds make all kinds of other sounds that may be really surprising to a lot right. of folks. But, uh, yeah, so th- those okay. are the main things to look for. Part of me is maybe I'm now gaslighting myself that I, there's a raven because some of the things you said, I feel like they fit. But mm-hmm. I can't I, I'm just going to have to go study, I guess, later today. Yeah. You know, and see. I mean, in that part of California, I would expect a mix. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Occasional raven, mostly crows. But I wouldn't expect to see them, like you said, hanging with one another. No. Okay. Interesting. Do do ravens, besides size, you know, crows, one of the most intelligent animals, I'm sure we'll talk about that. But um, do ravens possess greater intelligence in some way or are they sort Mm -hmm. of the same? So I, I tend to stay away from trying to put them on any kind of linear scale. Yeah. Intelligence is a really fraught topic. Uh, And I think we've done a lot of incredible work to investigate that concept within not only those animals, but across a variety of species. And we've learned so much about the incredible things that these birds can do and the the features that they share with us. But and that's and I say that, Kevin, because I get asked that question so much. Like, who's smarter? So so. And and it's it's just that they have different skills. (laughs) They they like their natural history informs different skill sets. And so ravens have some strengths that crows don't but um but i just don't know how helpful it is to like try and put them which one's on like that. it would almost imply one's better than the other which exactly. is certainly not true it, yeah i I, I definitely understand this, that like linear this linear goal of evolution towards some some intellectual towards, like, basically humanity that, yeah. yeah that yeah. is just not a helpful way to understand the natural world okay well here's a better question perhaps then is what in what ways are crows demonstrating certain types of intelligence that differs from ravens like where is where are those differentiation points let's take one step back and just talk about kind of how we understand this in in animals so when we when we're asking questions of intelligence cuz it it is kind of hard for folks to be like how can you measure that as a person right like mm. how is that not just completely clouded by your own hubris that's how and, i know, always think yeah to some extent you know of course it it is but the the sort of strategy we've taken is trying to identify features that we've demonstrated imply a level of executive function and cognition mm-hmm. that separates it out from instinctive trial and error or other forms of behavior that require a very simplistic mechanism. So yeah. the best way I can describe this, when you think about ants, think about the incredible things an ant colony can achieve. Right. Building bridges, building barges, like all of these things. It's not, and I think we can all agree, like ants don't have little degrees in physics because they, and they're not building bridges because they like, you know, we yeah. understand more about the world than an ant does. In certainly, <laughs> certainly, yeah. And so that's a good example of how really simplistic mechanisms can build to a really sophisticated outcome. The way I've thought about ants, sorry, is is like basically that's like an emergent behavior of 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 a colony type of of species, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Where it's like it's almost I almost think of ants like and look, I'm certainly you're more experienced in this world than I am, but I have my weird ways of thinking about things. I go ants feel like almost like the cells of an organ, which has greater function. The cells do not understand what they're actually doing. Um, but nevertheless, the heart pumps, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And so our goal when we ask questions about like, how smart is a crow is trying to tease out like, is this a sophisticated outcome that's guided by a really simplistic mechanism? Or is this sophisticated, complex thinking that's producing a complex outcome? Okay. And so we have what we call our sort of cognitive toolkit that guides us in understanding that. So that's whether or not these animals can demonstrate things like causal reasoning. So do Mm -hmm. they actually understand the relationship between what they do and the outcome that it produces? Or do they just go through the motions because evolution has taught them that it's really helpful to do that? Right. So that's one. Flexibility is another. So can they sort of change course with new information or in a new context, right? We're, we do that all the time. And anyone who's raised children have, has watched that skill develop where suddenly they're like, oh, I I can I learned this thing in this context, but I'm going to mm-hmm. reapply it. Translation, yeah. 
So causal reasoning, cognition, uh, flexibility, imagination is another really important one. That's something we take for granted because it's such it's such an essential you know part of the human experience. But it's actually incredibly difficult for your brain to imagine things that aren't happening. It's yeah, very yeah, hard. Yeah. So demonstrating that prospection, which is uh, mental time travel. So those are kind of the main huh. features that we look for. Interesting. And we've seen bits and pieces of all of those things across the variety of corvettes. Uh -huh. So scrub jays, for example, really good at that prospection, that mental time travel. And we've been able to demonstrate that through a variety of experiments, looking at how they hide food for later and their understanding of where to put food based on new information that they get or how quickly to recover food. Right. Ravens are really good at imagination, so they can imagine things, uh, competitors that they can't actually see. That probably has a lot to do with these really complex social lives that they lead and these, these very sort of political <laughs> yeah. uh, dynamics that they have. Um, New Caledonian crows, which is a species that lives on New Caledonia, are one of the only tool producing animals in the world. There's a, oh, wow. you know, a less than a handful of animals, including ourselves, that manufacture tools rather than use tools. Tool use is about 1% of all organisms, but tool manufacturing is like, you know, four or five. <laughs> species um, total. Species total. Us, yeah. let me, do I know? Let me see if I can guess. Us, the New Caledonian crow, mm -hmm. uh, and then like three primates. So there's a uh, cockatoo. Uh -huh. That's one of them. Yeah. And then a, a couple of primates and primates are a little tricky because there's there are more primates that do it in like captive zoo settings. That's also oh. true with crows. The yeah. now extinct in the wild Alala, which is the Hawaiian crow, uh, produces tools in captivity because that's the only remaining sure. population of these birds. But they probably did it in the wild, too. Okay. So that, that's why that number is a little wishy-washy, but it's very small yeah, <laughs> relative yeah, yeah. to the number of organisms. That's the main thing. Very small. And so, um, yeah, put together, this family demonstrates all of the, the features that we've identified are sort of the most difficult things for a brain as we understand it to do. I'd love to dive in a bit deeper, maybe just starting with with crows themselves? When we say crows, we're describing a bunch of different birds. Yeah. So we could be talking about American crows, fish crows, New Caledonian crows, hooded crows, carrion crows. And so our understanding of their intelligence comes from, you know, human observations of these birds, right? That span across the globe and across time. I think people, certain communities of people have appreciated how intelligent these crows, these animals are for a very long time. Um, and then in, in complement and kind of alongside to that traditional knowledge is then the Western scientific work that has come to sort of systematic, you know, in that uh, scientific method approach, attempted to then tease that out in, in that specific way. Mm -hmm. And so through that effort, uh, we have been able to figure out that these these birds are incredibly intelligent. And that was a big surprise <laughs> for, I mean, I think, you know, we're all familiar with that term bird brain, right? For a really long time, we yeah. in the Western science community didn't really appreciate that birds could be smart. And a big reason for that is that the brains of birds are very different from the mammalian brain. And of course, science is always going to be, you know, clouded by the sort of our hubris and the whatever cultural norms are you know, in that moment. And so for sure. a long time, we thought of intelligence on this linear scale, all leading up, you know, so the brain is in, when we, we thought about it as across animals, right? We have all of these different versions of the brain that then lead in the culmination of the human brain. And so if it doesn't look like that, it's much less sophisticated. A big difference between the avian brain and the mammalian brain is that bird brains are smooth. They don't uh, have the, the many folds that our brains do. And the reason our brains have those folds is to provide more surface area, more neuronal density, et cetera, et cetera. So we were like, ah, bird brains, they're smooth. They look more like reptilian brains hmm. done. They're just, they're probably very uh, simplistic, right? Primitive. Yeah. Uh, and we're, we were wrong. We were just wrong. <laughs> so we now we appreciate it more like a Mac and a PC, they are two different things, but right. they execute a lot of the same kinds of tasks, as it turns out. And in fact, birds like crows and ravens and some parrots have a much 
higher neuronal density than than any of the primates. Wow. So they're doing a lot in a very small space because their brains are about the size of a walnut. And that was yeah. the other mistake we made that we thought it was, you know, size mattered. Size mattered. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it does, but only in a relative sense. Right. OK. Yeah, exactly. That makes that makes sense. Do you think do you think part of this? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just I'm going to ask weird questions this whole time because I'm fascinated by this. Do you think part of what perhaps makes uh, Corvid so intelligent I mean, if you think about what they have to do, I guess any bird, right? It has to fly generally through the air and parse the data of what they're seeing and hearing and, and smelling at a much higher sort of frequency rate than other mm-hmm. species. Like if, I, if I'm if i a turtle, I just need to like, I mean, maybe a land turtle. I just need to like wander very slowly. Like I don't have to parse things flying around, small little bits, et cetera. Like it, it would feel like the brain would have to then evolve in a different way. Yeah. I mean, if you think about a pigeon on a sidewalk and look, pigeons have some things that they're, they're really good at, but they're not doing a lot of the same things that the crows and ravens are. Yeah. Let me put it that way. <laughs> but if you think about a pigeon on a sidewalk, they're going around, they're looking at these like micro food bits and just like, boom, boom, boom. Like yeah. I couldn't do that. That's real. That's an I, incredible skill, right? We, so we like, can't do that. Yeah. We can't do that. So, so that's another, you know, sort of reminder that like, again, really complex skills are not necessarily cognitively based. Mm-hmm, Animals can be mm-hmm. really good at difficult things like navigating through the three dimensional space of air uh, without necessarily doing a lot of like thinking, you know, I deep understand. Thinking behind I understand. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. But why are these animals so smart? That's a, that's a huge question. And there's lots of potential answers to it. Um, there's the social intelligence hypothesis, this idea that being social creatures, because if you think about who are the smartest animals, you name like primates, yeah. dolphins, elephants, yeah. corvids, parrots, right? What do they all have in common? They're all very social. Uh, so maybe something about that fuels this, uh, you know, needs to fuel this sort of like cognitive complexity because maintaining relationships is really difficult. Do you think it's because you have to develop like crows don't have theory of mind though, right? As far as we know. So they they have, uh, I would argue that they, they have demonstrated an equivalent level or near equivalent level of theory of mind as the non-human primates. Okay. Well then that, then that would imply to some degree that the social hypothesis, I forgot the name of it. Sorry. It, no, might, that's, might, that's it. Might, might be more levels. might be more correct because if you have to emulate a brain to to understand what that other brain might be thinking, it would make mm-hmm. sense that you you just by de facto need some level of cognitive capacity that that other species wouldn't need, right? Yes, and <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we've done other experiments that have really called into question than this idea. And there's, there's some really cool work by Kelsey McCune that looked at uh, scrub jays, which um, California scrub jays is pretty social uh, and compared, compared that to, I can't, it's been a while since I looked at this study. And now actually I'm trying to remember, she compared two different scrub jays. One is more social than the other to try and ask questions that would get at this idea is, is that social? Cause via the social intelligence hypothesis, we would predict that that species would be better equipped at, successfully completing oh. these tasks and mm-hmm. they weren't oh interesting and so it's so it's still up in the air so maybe it's not maybe it's or it's like multiple things coming it must together, be multi-variant right yeah, it i could mean be everything the food is thing. yeah yeah so like we also know that animals that have more generalist diets tend to skew a little bit better problem solvers because they're constantly having to negotiate uh, right a changing world or more urban animals right we're seeing if you compare like raccoons city raccoons versus rural raccoons and their problem solving ability we see differences there that's obviously a more contemporary evolutionary force mm. um, but yeah there could be lots of things feeding into what has produced these birds to be the way that they are now. So if we think about the city raccoon versus the rural raccoon, are you sort of suggesting that they always had the capacity, but it never needed to be unlocked because the environment they were in didn't require them to flex the cognitive capacity that they actually had? No, I would describe it more as a selective force. In in certain communities of raccoons, there's just more a selective pressure to oh. develop certain skills because the environment they live in is so complicated and, there's been, and changing. There's been enough generations of city versus rural raccoons to, for that selective force mm-hmm. to it's actually like apply fueling itself. This, yeah. yeah, it's fueling this growth. Now, you know, this is on a, on uh, from a 
geological evolutionary time scale very very small sure so sure, these sure. differences are nuanced and slight Here, but, here's a question um, then here's a question yeah, so so fast assume we don't extinct everything on the planet in 500 years we're still around to some degree um and assume you know uh, I don't know what the reproductive cycle of a raccoon would be, but let's assume like you could cycle it enough times that it really did like the selection became very evident. Would you then differentiate within like maybe maybe they look the same morphologically, mm-hmm. et cetera. They look the exact same. But would you then eventually say this is a different species because it's so much more intelligent than the rural raccoon? Yeah. So that gets in a, a really interesting question. And the answer um, is is. Yes, you could. You absolutely could. Yeah. Um, or sometimes what we do is we don't differentiate them as distinct species from like a taxonomic perspective, but we could differentiate them as different species from a conservation perspective. So we could say that the the raccoons in that have gotten really good or have developed this really interesting skill, they're not a different species than the raccoons over here, but we will apply special protections to this group. Okay. Because they are an evolutionary distinct unit or a culturally distinct unit. Interesting. Okay. Or we might call them a totally different species because they have shifted their role in the environment such that they look the same, but their role is different enough that we could call them a, a distinct different. species or a subspecies. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, I, I took us off a little bit here. G- g- let's go back to – actually, you know what? I do have a question. So when you design the experiment to quantify – in the Western way, as you've mentioned, uh, how how a crow might imagine or it might problem solve, et cetera. How do you know that you've designed the experiment in a way that the result actually is proof of that? Well, so you're never trying to show, you know, proof of something. You're trying to disprove something. Mm-hmm. So you have your sort of your null hypothesis and your working hypothesis and your null hypothesis is going to be, you know, uh, if they do this, then then they're not using theory of mind. Okay. And so you can disprove that and be like, all right, so that, you know, leaves the door open, <laughs> but we can't ever, you know, definitively prove that they are, you know, exhibiting theory of mind. And right, certainly right. within this field, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of back and forth where folks, particularly when it comes to like new Caledonian crows, they'll be like, all right, we designed this experiment. We think it demonstrates this. And then you'll get other scientists coming in and being like, no, it doesn't. And you didn't think about this, this or this, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A really good example of that is um, they've been using the Aesop's fable paradigm for a long time. So Aesop's fable paradigm is uh, borrows on the, the tail of the crow in the pitcher, where you have a thirsty crow comes across a pitcher, uh, with a little bit of water at the bottom, the crow can't reach it. And so it gathers stones, drops it in the pitcher, raises right. the water so it can drink. Yeah. And so we have adopted that um, to try and look for, you know, causal reasoning skills. Can these birds actually understand? And so they're, they've done a variety of experiments with New Caledonian crows where they give them uh, a very similar setup. You have a cylinder with tube and a floating piece of food, and they need to drop things to raise the water and access the food. And you give them objects that float versus sink or heavy versus light. And uh-huh. you see, like, can they correctly choose the object? And in general, across a lot of versions of those tests, New Caledonian crows are quite successful. And okay. so we were like, look at this, causal reasoning. They understand. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. And then just in the last year or so, this these were very recent, a bunch of meta studies came out sort of completely deconstructing the statistical uh, force of these experiments. Uh-huh. And suggesting that actually you cannot disentangle causal reasoning in that moment from trial and error based on the way that these studies were designed and the way that you interpreted them. Okay. And so this is a pretty constant, you know, back and forth within the scientific community about do these studies actually really show this? That's the question, right? Who are like, yes, they freaking do. (laughs) And you have other scientists being like, nah. And that's good. I mean, that's what keeps us, you know, that's what keeps us designing more interesting and better experiments. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the point. The po- that's the point of scientific progression, right, is yeah. is to battle it out. And, and to me, that's the beauty of the field, you know, when, when applied correctly, the, the, the world of science in general is everyone's a skeptic and, you, and you, everyone's trying to prove things uh, wrong, I guess, and, until you get towards like less and less wrong models of the world. Uh, right. Yeah. Man, this is so interesting. 
And where I initially found you was TikTok, Kaylee. Fascinating. And you had this post about how to ethically befriend crows. And the thing that stuck out to me in that sentence was ethically. I didn't understand what level of ethics was appropriate for that behavior or situation in the first place. And so perhaps we could even start there before we get into uh, how, how you could befriend crows in the first place. Anytime we are engaging and, and by engaging, what I really mean is feeding wildlife. Mm-hmm. We need to be doing a lot of work in the background, thinking about like, what are, what are the various outcomes of this? What are the problems associated with it? Because more often than not, it is a problem to feed wildlife. We as a culture have decided that birds are different and there's very good reasons for that. Um, You know, birds are small (laughs) for one. They don't generally attack people. Um, They don't generally cause like infestations or transmit diseases directly to people. Like there's all, all kinds of things we could unpack there, but it's really important to understand that like in general, feeding wildlife is not a good thing for wildlife, mainly Mm -hmm. for the wildlife, sometimes not for people, but mainly for the wildlife. And so, um, so that's kind of the, the first step. But like I said, birds for a whole variety of reasons are a little bit different, uh, But within birds, we still have to continue to do work to understand, like, you know, hummingbird versus eagle versus crow. Like, feeding those different birds has different, broader ecological consequences. And crows are a particularly sticky one because crows, while, you know, not primarily predatory, do depredate other animals, particularly bird nests. Can Can we define depredate? Yeah, so depredate just means uh, to to eat, and mm. uh, and I use depredate to distinguish it from predate, which mm-hmm. people also use synonymous, synonymously. But of course, written down, predate is exactly it's the same spelling as predate. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Gets, so depredate just helps sort of yeah. But yeah. eating, they eat other things. Okay. And for a lot of people, particularly backyard bird watchers, this is a really devastating reality of their backyard ecosystem. It is very hard to watch a robin, a pair of robins, carefully construct a nest, watch it with, you know, your family. You see the little beautiful little blue eggs. You see the little babies. They're working so hard. They're coming back. Bam, crow comes in and eats them all and you're devastated. Yeah. And I, that's such a reasonable reaction. (laughs) That is hard. Mm -hmm. And so people, so kind of the next sort of, element of this ethical perspective is when that happens, people are devastated. And sometimes, as we have seen many, many times over, uh, they then take that out on the predator. Yes. And so that's a way that we can, if we are um, creating an environment. So when it comes to the crows, when I talk about ethics, the main thing I want people to be thinking about is, are you encouraging more crows to your property and your neighborhood than would be occurring there if you weren't feeding them at all. Okay. Because the thing is, is they are going to eat other animals in your neighborhood. Not super often, except at the peak of the breeding season, because everything likes bird eggs. And don't get, you know, don't mistake this. Crows are not the main nest predators in your neighborhood, more than likely. It's other no. things like squirrels yeah. and mice and snakes. And There's a uh, hawk in they, my neighborhood. There's two hawks, right? Yeah, so they're but, probably doing some work. And that's great. That's what we want to be happening. But it is painful. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, that is great when we're not over supplementing the crows. If, however, you're putting out a big scoop of cashews every day, you're getting a flock of 20 birds. Right. And then they eat all the cashews and then they start leaving. And as they're leaving, they're just doing their little nest checks or whatever other, you know, animal treats they're looking for. Then you have tipped the scales you know, vastly in favor of the crows and you are creating a situation in which you are over supplementing a generalized predator. And yeah. that can be really bad. That can be bad. Okay. So let, let me play then for you my history of the crow in my backyard. So there is a mall somewhat near me that has an incredible amount of crows. It's like known in my area that this is the mall that has an insane amount so it's not too far away from me. I would imagine that some some of them peel off and, and come over to different properties or telephone mm-hmm. wires or whatever. And so most of the time, and I don't know the reproductive reproductive or migratory cycle, if there is one at all of crows, maybe we can talk about that later on. But, you know, it's, it's in the fall winter that they tend to kind of congregate in the neighborhood in all sort of different areas. And, and being that I have a telephone line running through my backyard, obviously my house is one of them. And so 
you know, for a while I was annoyed by them because I was like, there's 50 here and they'll just jump down and they'll be eating your seedlings or, or they'd be kind of poking through. And I have a pond in my backyard. And so they're bathing in the pond and it's nice, but it's not nice. And they're also on the roof and I can literally hear them on my roof kind of tapping along and pooping on the solar panels and stuff. So I, for a while I, I did not like them. Um, when, you know, spring and summer comes, they thin themselves out a bit. And I said, you know what, maybe I need to like change my perspective. And I looked a little bit of stuff up. It's where I started to find your, your work. Uh, and, and I said, okay, I'm going to like try to befriend the crows. Mm -hmm. And so can't beat them, join them. Cause I realized what am I going to do? I, I literally can't beat them. So, um, <laughs> what I did is I did not feed them whatsoever because there's enough fruit on my property. They seem to just sort of eat random stuff. Yeah. But I do have chickens. And so my chickens have these little um, black soldier fly larva. It's basically like a mealworm, but pretty close. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I started to just sprinkle some of those in a garden box. And they, I, I noticed the crows would come in and eat them. I didn't ever put a ton, maybe like, I don't know, a small pinch. Uh, and so it would be like two crows. Now, since I've been doing that for a couple of months, there's, there's like five now. Uh, and I didn't realize it because... I don't know anything about the crows, but uh, one of them was being really loud and annoying. And then it would be get hand fed or beak fed by the other. And I was like, OK, maybe that's a young one because uh, it was being really. And I was like, why does it need to do that? It has a beak. It can just eat itself. <laughs> um, but anyways, so then I screwed like a little plastic uh, platform on the outdoor run of my uh, chicken coop. And I sprinkled daily or maybe not even every day. I'll sprinkle just like a little handful and then the crows will eat it and then they leave. And I, and I find random stuff around the garden. So I, maybe that's where you've seen some of the stuff I've done where I found like mm -hmm. vintage lipstick. I found a pine cone, stuff that I verifiably know was not there before and no human would have put it there. So I'm like, it must have been a crow. I didn't have the evidence of them actually putting it down. But that, that's been my uh, befriending process. I don't know if that's correct or, or not. Yeah, no, I mean, that that sounds great. And the main thing is because that's another question I get asked a lot is like, well, what do I do if there's already a lot of crows in my neighborhood? And the answer is you just don't put out that much food. Mm -hmm. If you're not, you know, if you're only putting out 10 peanuts a day or, you know, a pinch of mealworms or whatever it is, it doesn't, you know, if 10 crows come into your yard to like check it out. If that's because they were already there, there's yeah. just not that much you can do about that. The The thing that we're trying to avoid is you creating a source of food that's so, what's the word I'm looking for? You might, you're going to have to cut this out. It, uh, it's, no, 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 you're fine. It's, it's, you're, let me see if I can get what you're trying to get at here. Because I think about this from a gardener's perspective. Mm -hmm. When when you over fertilize your soil, you encourage different microorganisms to, to live in that area than would otherwise be there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, when I first moved into the property, there were tons of earwigs because it was a uniform mulched surface of wood chips. Uh, and, and that's what earwigs want to basically decompose and nothing else was around. So thus, no, no predator to eat them, not a lot of bird life because not a lot of plant and water around. And, and so basically it was a abundance of, of earwigs and they just outcompeted everything until I brought the ecosystem back into some level of balance. Right. Yeah. And so if I was, if I was to overfeed the crow, I'm sort of hacking um, their ability to, to dominate uh, that area. Right. Yeah. I, I, that's a great way to put it. And so, yeah, as long as you keep your food limited, then you should be good. And look, if you're like, I'm doing that and I have, I don't feel good about this. Like I'm looking around my neighborhood and I just have this nagging feeling, listen to that and stop feeding them mm -hmm. and do what you, what you have unintentionally done and provide trees and other vegetation that could then be a source of food for them, but is not yeah. an explicit offering to them, but just make your property attractive. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the primary way they feed anyways, because I have this mm -hmm. huge loquat tree that it, it's a delicious fruit. It's one of my favorite fruits, one of my favorite trees, actually. Uh, but it's so big. I mean, there's just no way you, uh, one human oh, yeah. or a few can eat it. And and so the crows are in there all the time. And what I noticed is they were in the tree. They'd go into the tree and then they'd come out to my pond area and they'd break the loquats down. And they would actually peel the skin, which I found interesting because the skin's edible. Like I ate the skin. Hmm. But they'd peel the skin off and then eat the fruit. And there's huge seeds on the inside. So, that, of course, they'd leave the seeds. And so there'd just be a little pile of seeds, uh -huh. which I thought was really, really kind of clever. And that that's where um, the pine cone was that one day. I have so far in my garden, I think I've gotten a lipstick bottle from like the 50s, which apparently on Etsy is worth like $50 if I clean it up. It's like a vintage lipstick case. So profitable. 
Um, and then I've gotten a pine cone, a key, a railroad steak, and a couple other things. I don't know if you've seen these little funny little pieces I've I've made, Kaylee, about mm-hmm. getting the gifts. Yeah. But I've gotten some crazy stuff. Uh, and, and it's not been because I knew how to do it. And so I'd, mm-hmm. I'd love to kind of refine my understanding of, I guess, maybe starting with why, why does this even happen? Why do they do this? I should have told you at the top of the episode to introduce me as Dr. Wet Blanket. Cause that's what mm. it's going to be. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, so this is the deal. Your experience of crows leaving things in your yard, totally valid. That is the yeah. thing many people have experienced. We get, I get emails about this, uh, all kinds of like cool, interesting, se- sometimes seemingly valuable stuff. Sometimes things that I really don't want, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but like, that's a real thing. The, the wet blanket though comes into it. When, when we use that word gift, yeah. so that, you know, for us, that implies a gesture of gratitude. And I'm not saying that that's not what they're doing, but I can tell you that we have no, no mm. one's done any work to actually show if that's what's happening. I get and it. And there are other ways that we could describe that. Look, these these birds, like we've talked about before, they live in these complex environments. They're constantly seeking out and trying new foods. They're really interesting. We won't get into this, but they're, they're a really interesting paradoxical animal because they're incredibly neophobic, which means they're scared of new things. And yet they live in a constantly changing environment and are very curious. So that's a, that's a weird thing we could say maybe for a, a future episode. But um the, the sort of take home message is these are animals that are going out in the world. They're like finding something and someone eventually is like, is this food? I'm going to pick it up and explore it. Mm. So one explanation for this behavior is they're like, huh, this is weird. I'm going to just carry it off someplace. And then they get to your yard and they're like, well, I want to go to that loquat tree because that's pretty delicious. I don't need this thing anymore. This wasn't food anyway. And then they drop it. And you're like, oh, yay, the food, the gifts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you and many people have that experience. So maybe that's what's going on. Maybe they do love your property and they're like, I don't know. We see Kevin. He's always handling, you know, shiny things made out of metal. Maybe he likes this stuff. And if we give it to him, he'll keep giving us food. Maybe that's that's, what's that's what on. most people assume, I think. Right. I, yeah. I, so let me see if I can get to what what you're saying here is, is what you're sort of saying. We're almost anthropomorphizing that behavior. We have no confirmatory evidence that cognitively they are saying I need to give this human being X gift to get Y treat or reward. Exactly. But the behavior nevertheless happens. And as a human, you could parse it however you want, I guess. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. we're pattern seeking animals. We always yeah. like to read meaning into into things. Yeah. It also and, makes you know, for a better story. <laughs> it makes for a much better story. And, you know, one way we could sort of understand this is like, why would a crow know what you value? You know what I mean? Like, how would a crow come to understand what would be valuable to you as a as a person? Mm-hmm. And when we look at people who like uh, Gabby Mann, who's a little girl in Seattle that got, you know, they fed a lot of crows. So they would get she had a whole tackle box full of her gifts. And there was a huge variety. And so when you sort of broke it down, you're like, well, most of this is trash. I mean, mm-hmm. it just is trash. It's not trash to her, nor should it be considered trash to her or you or anybody else who has this experience. But like. You know, it's that it's a confirmation bias, right? right. Like we right. want it to be a gift. And so we're like, this is a vintage lipstick tube that's worth $50. Of course, it's a, you know, because yeah. that's valuable yeah. to us. But like the crows don't know that. <laughs> the crows. Yeah. And and yeah, I definitely wasn't implying that the crows do know that. But I do think it's sort of a fun story to tell that. Yes. I have now somehow monetized a crow. You know, it's some sort of weird thing. Absolutely. And, yeah. and here's the thing that I really want to stress to your audience. I think but. As as people living in the world in which we currently do, we should make every effort to embrace the whimsy when yeah, we can get it. I agree. So I'm yeah. not here to tell you that you're not getting gifts from crows, but you did invite me on as a scientist. Absolutely. And so with my scientist hat on, I do have to tell you that there's no evidence that that's really what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's an I, open-ended question. It's an open-ended question. I would, I, I mean, look, I tend to agree with your perspective here in the sense of if you really break down what's happening, perhaps in the crow brain, it's unlikely. It would seem unlikely they would be making that connection. Um, but I guess the question would then be if we think that, let's say, the New Caledonian crow understands to drop objects of different density to, to raise the level of water, thus to eat the snack. Mm-hmm. Would it would it not follow perhaps that 
it would be possible to train a crow to give a certain type of object to receive a certain type of reward oh, in absolutely. the sense, in the sense of not, not in the sense of like, they think they're pleasing you by giving you a gift, but in the sense of, I know I'll get this if I do this to this moving little blob, that's a human being. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, yeah, you, know, you can think of it just the way that dogs offer sits. You yeah. know, they're like in the past when I do this, you've given me treats. So if I just offer it, will you continue to right? Like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. They can be. And so they might be exactly training themselves because they do it the first time. Maybe it's an accident. Maybe it was on purpose, whatever, whatever. And mm -hmm. then we're like, this is amazing. Here's more food. And they yeah. go, aha. <laughs> so and is there is there a difference then between the training of a crow and that being an example of. Uh, cognitive function because you can train like you said you can train yes. a dog you can train right yeah so th that would require you know specific studies to parse but there yeah. could absolutely be a difference between causal understanding and just sort of tra you know training um, it yeah yeah training it but to the most important thing i, I want to get at in this question is one of the other pieces of evidence that we have that this is maybe a little bit more random is that there are many people who feed crows regularly who don't ever get gifts, mm -hmm. right? So this isn't an inevitability as mm. you build towards this relationship. And there really isn't any, as far as I've been able to assess, a um, roadmap for how to get gifts from the crows. Damn. Okay, that was yeah. my next question was yeah. how can I enhance this ability of some kind, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, but, I, but I think that that is what makes it as magic as it is. I think yeah. if it, it would be way less cool if it was this thing that we could, um, you know, that we could manufacture and yeah. hack. Yeah. It wouldn't be as special. Here's a question. Can a crow carry a golf ball? Do you yes. think? Yeah. Okay. Then for sure I got a golf ball from a crow. Yeah. Because it was, Raven, it was. Definitely. And maybe I have ravens because now I don't know. Now I need to go go look and and mm -hmm. research. Yeah, and become a, a naturalist. Golf ball would be it'd be tough. I've absolutely seen ravens carry golf balls. It would maybe be a little bit tough for a crow, but I think they could do it. I think they could do it. And yeah, I mean they they would be the ones leaving it in your yard. <laughs> Here's been my yeah. This has been my clue. Is I go is it an aged item of some kind? Mm -hmm. uh, so the golf ball had beyond the fact that it was just in the dirt. It also had like the appearance that it was once perhaps buried or something like that. You know, uh, there's, there's this old bottle that I got. It's like a brown tone, old vintage hair dye bottle or something. The top's broken off, but I can see. Where do you see... live? There's all this stuff around. Oh my well, that's, goodness. Well, that's my question is I'm yeah. like, how are these, how are these guys giving me old stuff? You know, um, yeah. not just They're... like junk. It, it's right. old. It's like vintage things. I don't even get it. it. Someone, someone messaged me and said it must, there must be a construction site nearby. Cause I do know when what, we put a pond in my backyard and when we did the pond, we did this underground reservoir. So we dug out a decent amount of soil and we found similar bottles um, yeah. in that area. And I think back in the day, there used to just be a junk spot in the backyard that a lot of folks would just throw their old bottles in. And so I think that's yeah. probably where it's coming from. That's my best guess. They do love construction sites. Yeah. So, so here's the question that I, and it sounds like you've already answered it, but it, it seems like there is no basic process between uh, of, of manufacturing this type of relationship. No, no, yeah. it's, it's luck of the draw. Like if you feed them, this might happen to you. And if you can continue, once they do it once, they'll probably do it again. It has okay. seemed to be the pattern, Okay. but, um, but you know, they just might not, which is brings us back to this idea of like, is it a gift? Because, the, the issue with that then yeah. is if it really is a gift, it's a, if it's a gesture of gratitude, then what that then implies is that some crows are grateful and some crows are not. Some crows are nice and some crows are assholes. <laughs> and yeah. they're like, oh, you're giving me all this food and I'm not going to say thank you. Right? That would actually you be a to... fascinating, if that were to be true, yeah. that would imply like a much greater level of sophistication amongst oh, yeah. the crow, right? Oh, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So let, let me, let me share this then. So yesterday I decided to try to elevate this experience of which maybe now I, I can't, but I guess we'll find out. I'm going to keep trying. Mm -hmm. uh, so I put the same amount of uh, treats on the platform, but then I put a quarter, a nickel and a penny on maybe to try to signal like, thanks. And then here's these and do with w this information what you will. Right. Yeah. So in 20 minutes I left cause I don't, I don't think they like to be watched. Like you said, um, mm -hmm. So I, I left, although I've noticed they don't mind being watched as much as they used to. 
That's, so they're a little yeah, more, they will get know, used to it. Yeah, yeah. They're a little more the used to it. where it's not a non-issue. They just don't even care, right? And so yeah. anyways, so 20 minutes later, uh, everything but the quarter is gone. Don't know where it is. Uh, today, I, will, I went out. The quarter has gone and the treats are gone. And then on the ground is a penny, but it's not the same penny. Hmm. It's a different penny because I looked at every single thing. And so yeah. I go, there's no way that that happened that fast, right? Like there's just no way. And it doesn't, based on what you're saying, it doesn't even make sense. But I'm trying. Yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, like I said, there, there has, is yet to be a, you know, doctor of crow gift giving um, because no one's going to fund doing this kind of exploratory work. So like you might be doing, you're, you're doing it, Kevin. I'm t- like, I'm t- you t- it's be, time to fund. It's time to yeah, fund. Yeah, because these are really interesting questions. And, you know, the, my criticisms with a lot with like, um, we haven't really touched on it yet in the episode, but like the crow box, the butts for nuts, all of the like strategies. <laughs> Uh, of training crows to pick up cigarette butts and we'll feed them. That's how we'll mm-hmm. pick up our butts. My, my issue, and I have in a variety of places sort of voiced my, my concerns mm-hmm. with these things, is not that they're not smart enough to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Right? So, like, I, d- you know, I-, I would absolutely not put it past the crows to be able to be like, food, and then you put these other things there, and so let's try and, like, bring that other thing back and see if we get more food. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's within their capability to do. And I would be so interested to see what you learn. Yeah, maybe we can talk offline about how to ensure that what I'm doing is like verifiable in some way in a mm-hmm. scientific sense. So I'm not just like making random stuff up in my head, you know? Someone recommends me this crow box, um, which I believe basically uses like, it says it uses Skinnerian training models to like get the crows to realize that if they put you know, a coin in the box, it will then release this platform and then they can eat the nut. So it sounds like your, th- your thesis, your theory is that that's not really perhaps working or, or what, what no. do you think about it? So my problem is that, um, in captive settings and for small or short term settings, those can work really well, right? Yeah. Like crows will absolutely learn exchange tasks. And we use that in a variety of other scientific context to like demonstrate, you know, so like we've been able to show that they understand equity and Mm. they won't, if they see somebody else doing an exchange task for which they're getting a higher quality reward, they're like, fuck this. And they stop doing it. (laughs) So we use exchange paradigms to, to test all kinds of questions so they can absolutely learn it. My issue with the like butts for nuts tech things that happen every couple of years or so is that you can't scale it up because Uh ultimately the, the issue you run up against is if crows are if if what you're asking crows to do is spend a lot of time searching for things at some point they're like why would i search for the thing that then i have to go use to get the food instead of just searching for food uh eventually they're like this is less efficient yeah and so you need like high quality food or there's just all kinds of ways that over time and at a bigger scale that just breaks down. But for the backyard crow watcher, yeah. I think that this is a really fun thing to do and you may very well be successful. Here's a question. And I don't, this is not, I don't probably think this is an ethical thing to do, but is, can crows become addicted to certain substances? I don't I, know, a drug I, or they, something? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, they've, they've got the receptors. Um, I don't see Could, why they wouldn't be. Because you could then say the food that's in the box, you could make so valuable because it's addictive yeah. mm-hmm. that then they would they would actually go a less a less efficient path to get food because that's actually the highest value food, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yeah, if it's if it's if that's the only source that they could get it from, and they were like addicted to it, yeah, I think then you probably <laughs> you could don't do that, anybody. <laughs> this is not. But yeah. that could that could discover something. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to yeah. do it. I mean, but, uh, you know, we, we cause addictions in animals to learn things all the time. So that's how we yeah. understand dopamine receptors and poor yeah. rats. Hmm. Yeah. But, the rats um, have, have had it hard these days. Yeah. But interesting ideas. When I first experienced crows in the garden, I didn't like them that much because there were just so many in the garden. And I was afraid perhaps of what they might do to my delicate seedlings that I've spent so much time starting, et cetera, et cetera. So Kaylee, what, do you think contributes perhaps to this dislike, this inherent dislike of crows? That's the perception I guess I get culturally. I don't know if that's founded or not. The answer is particularly in Western cultures, because across the world, people feel very differently about their local species. So this idea that they're always 
you know, these indications of impending death or they're always read as ominous signals. That's a Western thing. Mm-hmm. You know, lots of, uh, that's yeah. Um, and that has there's sort of a long history of that. It comes from their associations in battlefields consuming dead bodies. That's not something, you know, in the sort of like uh, anthology of of Christian religions we tend to like. We have very specific ways we want to treat the dead and getting eaten by scavenging animals. Not high on that list. So we don't like them for that reason. Uh, during the plague, again, you had this period of time where you had lots of dead bodies. You had doctors sort of dressed as these birds because they had those big masks, right, that they filled with aromatics. And so kind of we've been creeping towards this stronger and stronger association in that context that has sort of culminated now into these birds often being viewed as these, you know, doom and gloom sort of Mm -hmm. like angels of death or something like that. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. And and there's, like I said, long, rich, really interesting history of how that came to be. The other side of that coin then is the gardener more specifically. Sure. And why the gardener maybe comes into the relationship um, with a more negative attitude. And the answer to that is that crows are obnoxious as hell. And I love them for that, (laughs) but they are. I mean, I have so, my sister, oh my gosh. So she's been planting this rooftop garden and like she could not keep a marigold in the pot to save her life because they just, as soon as she planted them, boom, crows would come, just rip them out all over the, and she's just like, why? What can I give you to make you stop doing like, I don't get it. So like there are very legitimate reasons why gardeners may not have, um, you know, may not have the best opinions of these birds. Mm -hmm. But as you discovered, it's way more fun to join them. And it only takes a few tweaks, right? It takes a little bit more work, a little bit more material, Mm -hmm. but you can create a situation in which you have a robust thriving garden in complement with crows. And for chicken, you know, for the backyard chicken farmer, I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me saying, thank God for the crows because they have protected my chickens from raptors on more than one occasion. So I actively keep them around. because That's what changed my my opinion. That's what changed it because there's this massive pine tree down the road. It's so big. You can see it's like a couple blocks away. You can still see it. Um, And that's where these two or three, I don't know, hawks live. I think it's like a Cooper's hawk in my area. And you uh, now I now I'm like attuned to the different calls of these birds. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh, that's obviously that's a hawk in the air. And I'll just see the crows go at it and they hate it. And I'm like, well, that's great because they're not going to eat my chickens. But the hawk 100 mm-hmm. percent will. And my my chickens have a small it's like it's not physically protected, but it's sort of obscured outdoor run. So yeah. a hawk like could get in. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's when it changed my opinion. I was like, oh, OK, look, my little my little hens are protected by, you know, the, the birds in the sky. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Going along with this, like misconceptions about crows, like it seems like people think they're like diseased or mm-hmm. like, you know, they're like sick or something. Is that just part of this mythology, I guess, that you've suggested that, that crows have, have developed? Yeah, there's no crows aren't any more susceptible to disease, uh, to disease as a whole than any other bird. Now, there are yeah. some diseases that are more lethal in crows, like West Nile virus. Mm-hmm. Um but crows don't carry crow-specific diseases. Got it. Okay. And from a human health perspective, no one has ever gotten sick. According to the CDC, like no one's ever gotten sick from touching a crow. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you you should always be careful when disposing of dead birds. But they're also, the other thing about them is they're not like pigeons, not to villainize pigeons, but like they don't, they don't roost in your house. Yeah. Right. So the problem with pigeons <laughs> is they come and they'll roost in your house and they do. They, there's, you know, there's definitely you don't want to touch crow poop. Like, right. let, let me be right. clear about that. Like they carry some nasty stuff, but because they are not of the ilk that will come and like nest and roost in your rafters of your barn or in your attic, there isn't that same kind of contagion disease spread that we are concerned with with other kinds of birds. So I don't really know Got where it. that perspective that they're like dirty outside of just the fact that they eat dead things. And of course we as people like have that association with it. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. That's like, you think of a vulture as like a yeah. dirt, dirtier bird, let's say than a, I don't know, a Robin or something right. like that. When actually, sorry, but I have to say this vultures are amazing. And when we think about them being dirty could not be more wrong. Cause they are literally ridding the world of things like, 
botulism yeah anthrax because they can put they just like (sighs) dissolve it in their system so they're not dirty birds they are cleaning up the world for us please love your local vulture i need to find some local vultures to love because now i'm a bird guy i guess and i might start an offshoot channel about this it's so interesting to me okay so that's one of us (laughs) i'm in i'm in we're doing some more collabs down the road let's do it um okay so do scarecrows work it makes sense that they wouldn't, right? If this animal is this level, has this level of intelligence, like eventually I'm just going to, if I'm a crow, I'm going to be like, that thing hasn't moved in seven days. It's probably not yeah. a threat, right? When I first started getting into crows I, as an undergrad, I was like, all right, I'm going to do my like senior thesis on this. And John Marsloff, who's who I eventually did my PhD with, mm-hmm. he's the one that did the facial recognition study where they wore the masks and showed that crows remember people who had uh, threatened them in the past. Okay. So for my... Uh, project, I wanted to look at whether or not they could recognize friendly people. Mm -hmm. And so testing uh, that kind of relationship is harder, though, because trust is a takes a longer time, more time to build that throw a rock. And yeah, exactly. And so I was like, okay, how do I get them really habituated to a particular face in the in the time under the time constraints of like, I'm an undergrad and I'm blah, blah. So my idea was I got these Halloween masks. I got a variety. Of, I got like Hillary Clinton, and Obama, and a bunch of different uh, political masks because that's what was available. And I, I put them on a, I had them set up on a lawn chair. I created like dummy bodies for them with like a garden glove holding, you know, a, a bowl of peanuts. And I put it on the roof of my science building. I was like, this, this will be it. And then they come, and they like see Obama with his little bowl of peanuts every day. And they're going to be like, that guy, I like that guy. And th- this will work really well. And they started coming, you know, after about 24 hours, they would just come, boom, 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 get all the peanuts. I'd refill it. And so then the day came for me to like have a volunteer put the mask on mm. and see if when they threw the peanuts, they would come right up to, you know, th- this person, right? Obama, yeah. Yeah. because they had been now accustomed to feeding essentially out of his hand as a, as a dummy, as a scarecrow. Sure. And absolutely not when they do that. They're like, as soon as it started to move, they were like, this isn't the same thing. Obviously, Lady yeah, God, I'm, give I'm us not some interested. credit. So yeah, the, and in an, an unmoving object is they are just going to habituate to it, which is exactly why the like plastic owls don't work either. Got it. Okay. So, okay, here's, what about this then? What, what if anything would work? We don't have a good answer to that. Like, okay. it, you know, if we did, we wouldn't have this, the kinds of human wildlife conflicts or endangered species conflicts that we do. Yeah. But there are definitely things that you can try that might work. Glittery, like tinsel or CDs. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the way that it moves around and flashes can be a little bit spooky to the birds. Putting up just what we eventually did for my sister's garden is we just put like bamboo stakes all around the fresh plants because they only do it when they're brand new in the ground and they're little. So Mm -hmm. we just kind of created like an inhospitable barrier around freshly planted things. And then once they sort of established, we pulled all the stakes out. No problem. Netting, another really good option. Sure. Yeah. Um, You can try like paint a big, get a big piece of poster board and put two big eyes on it. Mm. And sometimes that those forward facing eyes can sort of they, they see it and it's like predator. But the, again, the problem is after a while, they yeah, yeah, like, yeah. this isn't enough. It seems like that's why the glittery CDs, et cetera, works because they're the movement is random enough via the wind movement. that they may never, in theory, get used to it. Yeah. Um, a, a wacky inflatable arm flailing tube man would really be the best thing you could do because <laughs> that, that, that they would be like that problem. That's, enough, that's a real product. Like, yeah. That product yeah. exists. Yeah. Put that out in your garden. Just woo. You'd have a yeah. party and no crows. <laughs> Perfect. There you go. That's actually perfect. Well, this has been fascinating. I'm super, super interested in this still. I've been informed. I've learned a lot. Uh, Kaylee, where can people find you online? So they can find me on all the social medias. So Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, all at uh, the Corvid Research handle. I'm more active. I'm the most active right now on Instagram and TikTok. Um, But but you can find me everywhere. If you want to just learn more about uh, crows, check out my blog. I have over a hundred articles I've written on all kinds of topics meant to be pretty short reads, just informing you about the most common things that I get asked and people are, are curious about. Um, so yeah, I would say those are the, the best places to reach me. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I'm sure I'll be bugging you about crow things for a while to come. So hopefully I don't become too annoying, but thanks for coming on Kelly. Yeah. Thanks for giving me the space to talk about my favorite thing. 